This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. All right, we are back. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, episode two. We have uh, we are the uh, Snake Bros, Brothers of the Serpent, Kyle and Russ. How's it going? We got Randall in the house. We got Brad and the mysterious Mike. Hello, <laughs> Mike. Mike the Scriptard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Randall. So, did Hello, you, gentlemen. Did you look at these uh, these earthquakes that happened recently in? Uh, yes, and like I said, I haven't really had a chance to investigate the specifics of these particular earthquakes, but. Early on uh, in doing research into geophysical forces, I came upon the work of um, Michael A. Persinger and Ghislaine F. Lafreniere, and they co-authored a book that was published in 1977 called Space Time Transients and Unusual Events. You ever heard of it? No. No. That sounds awesome. Excellent work. Seminal work. I mean, it was a... Groundbreaking in its time, and I think it's uh, only increased in relevancy since it was published uh, way back in, in 77. So, so this is, this is the, the premise of the book, and I'm going to do a short reading here, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So this is what they say. The authors contend that the existence of man upon a thin shell beneath which mammoth forces constantly operate cannot be overemphasized, nor is it exaggerated in perspective. Beneath the two times 10 to the eighth power square miles of surface life activities, geophysical forces continue to interact and induce changes upon that surface. Shifts in the crust are felt as earthquakes. Distortions in distributions of mass or metals result in large-scale magnetic and gravity anomalies. These are the obvious, the blatant, and the easily measurable productions. But probably there should be smaller areas, perhaps not more than a few feet in radius, in which these subsurface forces are manifested. And here's the key. In areas where the constructions and compositions are more optimal relative to adjoining spaces, the forces could be significantly different or magnified. Mm. Um, You're talking like gravity wells or, or? Well, okay, so let's go on here. Recent developments in seismology have opened many avenues for understanding pre-seismic events. Perhaps the most outstanding idea has been pursued and elaborated by Finkelstein and Powell in 1970. These scientists have suggested that during the strain of seismic pressure, forces pushing on rock crystals in a large area produce electrical fields through a modification of the piezoelectric effect. These pre-fracture electric fields can reach values of several thousand volts per meter. Intensities capable of ionizing the local area into visible luminosities. Indeed, one of the more constant contiguities of unusual events has been between earthquakes and luminous airy displays. Interesting stuff, isn't it? I'll, I'll yeah. go just a little bit further with it. Um, and the extent of these fields may be by no means small. Consider the large subsurface regions, perhaps hundreds of square miles in area, with near fracturing forces pushed upon them. The resultant electric and magnetic fields produced could involve large volumes of space reaching high into the ionosphere. About one hour before the Hilo Hawaii quake 
of April 26, 1973, radio transmission ceased due to the apparent disappearance of the ionosphere. What extraordinary electric forces must have been generated before that fracture? <laughs> Such well, forces may accumulate for weeks or perhaps even months and may be expressed in a qualitatively different fashion since the quantal sums of energy required for a fracture would not have been reached because the electrical field produced by the accumulating strain is not sufficiently intense to permeate large areas of surface space. It is concentrated into the most susceptible localized area. The result, the net result, is an electrical column. Now, during the pre-fracture sequence, or alternatively, as long as the particular stress is maintained, a number of interesting possibilities could take place. First, due to high electric field, the high electric field in the localized area, low level ionization of the air within and adjacent to the column could occur. It is important to realize that the electrical field column hypothesized is not refrained from movement. In fact, its spatial dependency would be primarily determined by the subsurface forces producing it. If the subsurface stress is moving along the fault line or rift, the concomitant surface manifestation would also move in a similar manner. The actual shape or physical dimensions, that is the height above the ground, would depend wholly upon these forces and their interactions with the characteristic electrical properties of local structures, including large buildings. Hmm. Interesting stuff. And I'm going to share a screen here showing a, an illustration from the book um, of the hypothesized electrical field column and it should be coming right up here oh man <laughs> as it says an electrical field column produced by accumulating tectonic stress in subsurface regions now again here's some of the key ideas of what we were just looking at the idea that it's subsurface forces stresses within the lithosphere that is producing these electrical field columns as a consequence of the piezoelectric effect, which is when you put pressure on crystals, it generates electrical fields. The other point is that these fields are not necessarily stationary. They might move. They might be transferred along uh, fault lines or fractures with uh, movement of stresses through uh, through the, the plates of the lithosphere. The third thing is that there may be a means, natural or otherwise, of concentrating or magne magnifying these fields. And again, as they made the point here uh, in, the, uh, in the last quote, uh, last part of the quote, um, that uh, it could uh, include large buildings. As it says here, um, depend wholly upon these forces and their interactions with the characteristic electrical properties of local structures, including large buildings. Wow. Could that uh, include uh, temple structures of old? Mm. Could it include pyramids? Uh, could it include, yes, why not? Um, <laughs> Man. So I would just like everyone that's listening to understand that this is Randall saying that he didn't have anything to say about this particular incident. This is what he says when he doesn't have anything to say. So just wait till he actually studies it. <laughs> and then we'll hear what he says. Because <laughs> when we were first talking about this before the show, he was like, well, I don't, I don't really have anything to say about that. So this is him having nothing to say. That's, uh... Well, then, then let me um, conclude with um, what else I don't have to say. <laughs> As it says here, the existence of electrical columns produced by accumulating tectonic stress would affect living electrical systems as well. Recent experiments indicate that animals may be sensitive detectors of electric, magnetic, and infrasonic fields. Science is still not clear how animals detect ambient fields, but some species seem to use them for migration and perhaps even communication. Man. So, yeah, and that's where, to me, it really gets interesting is this uh, 
you know, living electrical systems. And then, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it with this because this, I think, uh, opens the door very suggestively to, to some possibilities here. Perhaps the most complex bioelectrical system of all is man. Yeah. Within a small three-dimensional locus called a body, unfathomable ensembles of electromagnetic circuits exist. These circuits are correlated with experiences of consciousness, memory, perception, and all the various properties labeled human. Typically, human bioelectrical field patterns are displayed in a systematic manner and consciousness and thought to flow in a perceived orderly manner. But even this system is not infallible. Experiments by Leduc and more recently by others indicate that small currents induced across the scalp can produce dreamy-like states, episodes of paralysis, or intervals of unconsciousness. Certain combinations of electric current polarities and intensity seem to influence the DC battery or steady state potentials of the brain. Ironically, one of the most electrical, electrically unstable parts of the human brain is the hippocampus, an important component of the emotion and memory circuit. If this system is stimulated, even in the waking state, the person is inundated by stored images, real or unreal, that he or she cannot control. The stimulating currents are not very large in magnitude and could quite possibly be induced by transient electrical fields allegedly produced by substructure geological stresses. The implications of this supposition are immense in scope. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> and I think this might provide actually a key to understanding uh, certain aspects of the ancient science. Yes, that's... But not only were the ancient master builders and architects great engineers and, and, and geometricians, uh, they were all, and astronomers, they were also sophisticated geologists. Yes. And I was going to bite my tongue there, but I saw on your, on your screen sharing, though, that that is part of your Holy Grail program. So... Mm. The, the ever-present tease of Randall's future programs that is <laughs> within the Holy Grail. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I saw that too. I wasn't going to say anything either, but yeah, I did see the title screen on that. So, I, but I agree with you on the, um, uh, that, it, that it's, it both like implies certain things about possibly ancient structures, but also uh, we know that animals start freaking out, say 30 minutes before an earthquake. Yeah. Yeah, and it hasn't really been totally understood. People assume that they are hearing some kind of infrasound, or they're detecting something that we can't detect. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a that's an interesting thing. Uh, so, what do you think about like birds, for example? Now, this may be going off a tangent a little bit, but you know, the incidents where before and after earthquakes, or even just without that kind of stuff happening at all, birds suddenly all fly down into the ground, or they all, you know what I mean? Where it's like a, they call it a mass suicide of bird of flocks of birds. Mm -hmm. uh, well, probably a geomagnetic effect too, or something. That, yeah, that would be my first hypothesis to to explore. Yeah. Would be yeah that they're responding to um, ambient fields that are undergoing uh, to trial say to transient ambient fields. Yeah, that are maybe perhaps even messing up their system of navigation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be. I mean, I I haven't looked at any particular uh, studies specifically on that, although I do have in my library some interesting works uh, that do deal specifically with that. It's just that, you know, in the limitations of time, I haven't been able to really pursue that. Uh, um, yeah, but yeah there, there is research out there that, that links animal, uh, particularly, you know, yeah, I mean, as somebody who's always been an observer of nature, I, I always enjoy watching um, flocks of birds, like starlings, for example. You know, you you might see a flock of hundreds of starlings, and it's almost as if they're flying with one brain. Yeah. You know, I mean, they'll literally come in, and they will simultaneously all change directions. Right. You know, um, and I constantly look at that, and I, I think about that. Well, okay, what's going on there? What's going on there? What? Yeah. You know, um, uh, there's so, a there's a place. Uh, I can't remember exactly where it is right now, but there's a place. Maybe it's in Spain. 
where at two weeks out of every year in the same t- in the same two weeks, it's like in the fall or something. Don't, don't quote me on this, but two weeks out of every year, the same two weeks out of every year, there's a, a like a two kilometer long, a 200 meter wide strip of land where any flock of bird that flies over it dives straight down into the ground. Every like clockwork. Where is this? It's somewhere in Europe. Uh, I, somewhere in Europe. Yeah, it's like Spain or uh, I don't know, but it's actually become a tourist attraction. There's two weeks out of every year, this one strip of land where any flock of bird that flies over it just t- dr- dives straight into the ground just for two weeks out of every year. It's a very strange phenomenon. Very strange thing. It is very strange. But again, I have no idea what the explanation is. Yeah. I would, however, if I was trying to come up with an explanation, I would probably begin by looking along the lines of these things we were just talking about. Yeah. You know, transient electromagnetic fields, uh, the interaction between those fields and animals' internal systems of navigation and communication, I think would be the starting point for trying to understand something like that. Right. And, and, and bringing it back to um, the idea of uh, that, these, uh, that this knowledge of transient electromagnetic fields may have been involved as part of the, what we might want to call the archaic science. A uh, number of years ago, I did a, a, an interview with um, Paul Devereaux, who founded the Dragon Project in England. Are you familiar with his work at all? Uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, he, he's worth looking into. He's done some great stuff on the uh, addressing the, the, the geological sighting, sighting, S-I-T-I-N-G, sighting of many of the ancient megalithic structures in the British Isles. And he is built upon the work of, of people like Alexander Tom and John Michel um, and others and extended it and really interesting stuff. I, I've been a student of his work really, I think, probably since the late 70s, maybe when his first book came out. But he did a book uh, called uh, Earth Lights, came out in 1982. And um, he was addressing this, an idea that just came up uh, in uh, the quotes I was reading earlier from Space Time Transients. And uh, he's referencing the work of John Michel, who did a lot of the geomantic work of looking at the um, the sighting uh, criteria for many of these ancient structures. And of course, he uh, recognized the astronomical component of it, but he was one of the early uh, researchers who also said there's a geological component to the sighting of the ancient structures. And, and Devereaux picked up on that and, and, you know, took it to a whole, whole other levels with his dragon project. But uh, I'm going to quote uh, here from, from his book, Earthlights from 1982. As long ago as, and in the context of what we just learned from space-time transients, I think you, you'll see the, the potential significance of this. As long ago as 1969, John Michel was associating sacred sites with geological faulting, but more by intuitive observation than anything else. The lie of the land surrounding most Stern's stone circles gives the secret away. McCartney's work has now been able to confirm this earlier suspicion. Uh, This is actually a Paul McCartney, but not the Beatle Paul McCartney, (laughs) or the substitute stand-in for Paul McCartney. (laughs) Um, But this one is a geologist, okay? All right. So anyways, McCartney's work has now been able to confirm this earlier suspicion. From the work he has currently done on stone circle distribution in England and Wales, McCartney is satisfied that every stone circle in those two countries is within a mile of a surface fault or lies on an an associated intrusion. Hmm. An intrusion uh, is essentially a a fracture in the Earth's surface that has allowed an upwelling of magma from deep within the lithosphere. That would be an intrusion because the material of of the lower lithosphere or asthenosphere even is intruding up into the crust, you see. Yeah. He goes on to say, there are enough examples to show that the ancients did not necessarily cite their structures within easy reach of the stones they wanted. There simply cannot be any doubt that place was paramount to the megalithic builders. It so happened that the requirements for their places occurred in heavily faulted or intruded areas. And that is a clue not to be missed. Right. 
isn't it also true that there a lot of sites were sometimes over aquifers or underground flows of water? Well, yes, because Russ, think about this. Um, the underground water, how is it going to, how is it going to move through the, through the lithosphere? <laughs> it's the going falls. to, it's going to use the fractures and fault lines. So the, wherever there's a fracture, it's likely that you would have, that would be the, the conduit through which the, the, the subsurface, the, the, the hydrosphere is moving under pressure. Uh. And bear in mind also that, 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 you know, the astronomical component is, is that just as the oceans are subject to gravitational forces that yield the, the tides, the obviously visible tides, the hydrosphere is, is tidal as well. And so there are subterranean forces that wax and wane with the moon and with the, the relative distance between the moon and the earth, the earth and the sun, the planets, and so on. And so you actually have this, this ebbing and flowing of, of subterranean tidal forces as well. So this could play into it because there may be times where pressures increase cyclically because of perhaps the relative positions of the, the moon or the sun, and then those pressures diminish. When the pressures increase, now this is when you may have what uh, the, the unusual, uh, the transient events, the yeah. unusual and transient events. Um, that may or may not actually lead, like it said, when the quantal levels are reached and, and the seismic rupture occurs, right? That's only the final, final act of this process, of this, this pressure building, this stress building process, you see. But you may have a buildup of stress and then a release of that stress without it actually causing a seismic event. But the, the building up of that stress now can induce the changes in the electromagnetic field. That would be the point, see? So now, if you are building structures, and see, this is where we may be getting into the science of this thing. They may have known how to design structures that were somehow able to concentrate or amplify or magnify or somehow exploit these changing energy fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man. <sighs> and that's kind of the key to all power plants, really, is is exploiting some type of natural changing, you know, energy. Yeah, a potential that's there that's right. because of this differential. Yes, whether it's, whether it's water that's basically being picked up off of the ocean by the sun, you know, the heat from mountains. the sun dumped onto the mountains and then flowing back into the ocean, we're exploiting that movement and transducing it into a different type of power. So it makes uh -huh. more sense like the, the tidal uh flows of the of the aquifers putting pressure on the you know crystalline structures in the ground creating these piezo piezoelectric fields yeah <laughs> but, I'll go, I'll go one, one more to finish up this quote from paul Devereux here um he says uh uh okay here we go scotland of course possesses the huge ancient Great Glen Fault. Naturally, we are by now not surprised to learn that megalithic sites abound in the region. Around the northeast eastern end of the fault, there are over 50 chambered cairns, including the famous Clava Barrows. Most megaliths congregate around each end of the fault. But it is interesting to note that over the last few years, archaeologists have come to think that the waters of Loch Ness, occupying most of the fault, cover long submerged stone circles. Mm. And here we have <clears throat> something interesting because, again, remember the idea that, that these uh, electrical field columns might actually impinge upon the hippocampus of the brain, inducing visions, inducing who knows what. Certainly, they've been associated with the perception of, of audible sounds, with luminosities. Could they possibly be associated with, uh, could these transient events include sightings of, you know, things that somebody interprets as a lake monster, yep. but only occurs during certain intervals when the forces are aligned correctly. Right. Uh, this is purely conjecture, of course, but I think it's it, it would be worth looking at further, um, because yeah, the Great Glen, 
um, which is this fracture that crosses Scotland, is occupied by Loch Ness, which, of course, is world famous for being, um, you know, the home of, of Nessie. But, you know, interestingly, as a side, <clears throat> you know, when you begin to look at all of these various lakes that have these monster um, myths and, and legends associated with them, they're pretty much all formed in, this, in a very similar way. Okay, so Lake Okanagan up in British Columbia, you've got Ogopogo, right? The formation of, of Lake Okanagan and Loch Ness are almost identical. <laughs> you had major glaciated valleys that were then subject to catastrophic meltdown and catastrophic erosion, huge deposits of sediment onto the bottom of these deeply eroded troughs and then filled up with glacial meltwater. When you look at uh, Champy, um, the, uh, the, the lake monster associated with Lake Champlain, same thing, same origin for that. Um, Flathead Lake monster, again, in Montana, there's a Flathead Lake monster, big old Flathead Lake, same genesis as all of these other lakes. I've often wondered about that, that all of these lakes that have the lake monsters all formed in basically the same way. They were glaciated valleys, that were carved by the glaciers and then underwent catastrophic melting. You see? Yeah. Recent sighting of Ogopogo, by the way. Best best video ever ever obtained of Ogopogo in the last in the last month or two. Yeah, I just okay. saw it a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to send that if I can find it. Yeah, that'd be that'd be awesome. Because when we were up there, we were we went to a bluff overlooking the lake and we're standing up there talking. And there's a big V wake moving across the lake. And we're standing like a bunch of, uh, you know, I don't know what it was. Were we stoned or half asleep or what was the problem? We were standing there. And then afterwards we were going, well, something was making this huge wake going across the lake. Yeah. Yep. And it yep. wasn't a boat. It was something, but we couldn't really see what it was. It was just um, a legend, Randall. Legends make huge wakes in lakes. Haven't you heard that? <laughs> huge wakes in lakes. <laughs> yeah. And, and it never it? fails. That's when the battery was dead. So oh, right. the camera was not working. Of course. You know? Now, see, that may not be a coincidence. That's right. see, within this, what we're talking about here, the fact that the batteries yeah. might be dead might be part of the whole phenomena. Right. Yep. Right. Yep, that electric field just zapped your batteries, man. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here near where we live uh, in Texas, we have the Marfa Lights. They're famous. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I've heard of them. Yeah, so it's basically you can go out in Marfa, Texas, and there's just this huge, enormous, flat expanse of desert with, like, mountains way in the background, like way back there. But there's this huge, flat expanse of, of just desert hard pan. And if you're, if you, and people see them all the time, they're almost a nightly occasion. You see like these little orbs or spheres of light appear and start drifting around out there in the desert. And, you know, they've tried to, people have tried to say, oh, they're vehicles on the distant mountains, but there's no roads. It, it really, it, they're just unexplained, uh, you know, luminous phenomena. And, you know, one of the best, I think, ideas, of course, there's no, there's no serious research into this, is that it's some kind of piezoelectric sort of stress, stresses underground causing, uh, you know, light phenomena. And, and, and what time of day do, are they usually seen? It's always, it's, it's almost always like in the, in the boundary between night and day. The time between times. Time between times. <laughs> so when the sun is moving, uh, you know, when it's dusk or dawn, but mostly dusk is when they're seeing. That's usually when people are out there is right at night. Well, you know, dusk and dawn, that's when, of course, you're going to have, um, Massive you know, change. a pretty significant change in, you know, the uh, um, thermal conductivity of the rocks. Right. You know, for, for eight hours, they've been subject to heat. Now the heat is going, so the rocks are cooling. Even though there's going to be a minuscule contraction, almost in, uh, unmeasurable in a, in a local area, when you're looking at a much bigger region, you know, those stresses just induced by the, the changing amount of heat energy right. being absorbed into the rocks could be significant. And yeah, so the, the, I would have guessed without knowing otherwise that it would have been dawn or dusk or both because there was a... When I was living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, back in '67, there was a uh, there was a place. I'm trying to remember. Maybe it was the, the Plaquemine Lights. It was the same sort of thing. 
right. where you would go. And I remember going out there one time and it, it was kind of unnerving and you did see, <laughs> you know, and I, I did, I, I came away from it, not a hundred percent convinced that I wasn't seeing like auto lights in the distance or something, but, yeah. but it was very much like that. And it had been a local legend um, for a long time. Right. Um, There's one near Brad too, Brown Mountain Lights. Oh uh, yeah. Check that out. Nope. I've heard of that too. Yeah. Brown Mountain Sorry, Lights. Brad. Oh yeah, and your your microphone, Randall, just went into your beard. <laughs> it traveled <laughs> into the beard. Oh. <laughs> well yeah. That's better. A transient electrical field column just passed through my house a moment ago. <laughs> so Sorry, Brad, what did you say when I thought when I mentioned the Brown Mountain Lights? I just said, yeah, that's up here in the neighborhood. So, yeah, I need to get on uh, with, with Micah Hanks and uh, yeah. take a little field trip out there because I know that's somewhere he, he, he heads off to. Well, if you take Micah, you're not going to see anything. <laughs> you need to go by yourself so that you'll see it and you can take selfies with it and then show them to Micah and be like, dude, what's your problem? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm prepared he's now. He's out there multiple times. He's never seen anything. He turns them off. Yeah, yeah. He's so, an anti anti Brown Mountain. Yeah, something's wrong <laughs> okay. with the polarity in his brain. Right. And he goes over. Yeah, I mean, it's, the way Mike is wired up, he neutralizes the electrical field columns. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> well, that's that's. See, here we here we are again. With when Randall has nothing to say about a topic, you can talk about that for hours. <laughs> yeah, and here we are again, running down Micah Hanks. You know, once again. <laughs> You know? Yeah, we should make a habit. What's he going to think when he hears this? <laughs> he's going to think, he's I gonna, need to be on that podcast. With those he's going to say, well, yeah, why am I not hanging out with those guys? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll throw another tangent in, and, I, and I've been trying to remember exactly the, the details of it, but, you know, somebody, somebody else is listening out there that's had this thought. I've been told by an astrologer that says that we're, we're moving into, or, you know, I don't know all the terms, but something, something about – moving into planet Uranus and there's going to be a lot more geological activity. So this happened like, uh, it's been, it's been probably three months, but there were several volcanoes that started going off within about a week of each other. And that was right before we transitioned into this, whether, whether it's earth or, or you know, like I said, I don't remember the details, but there's, there's something about going into the, the range of Uranus that there's supposed to be a lot of geological for the next several years, uh, somebody out there is thinking that. Yes, I've heard. I've heard it, and who knows what what that plays, but that's that's in there also. As a tangent, yeah, I know that. Um, uh, what is it? We've talked about this before on our podcast. The 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 uh, the almanac that they publish like once it's once a year or something like that, right? And they and they do weather predictions for the entire year, and they're seventy percent right. accurate. And when people have asked them, "How do you guys do that?" they say, "Oh, we just look at the planets." They use the they use the planets to help them do large scale long term weather predictions. So I can believe that for sure. Yeah. So that's another thing. You know, subtle forces, except on an even yeah. more massive scale than these internal Earth forces. But what type of weird electromagnetic and gravitational forces? How how does that change everything that's going on on the you know? With the whole planet itself, I mean, yeah, right, who knows? right. Yep. I'll, I'll I'll ask my friend and try to get the details on yeah, that, so details. so I can say yeah. that for sure next time. Yeah, for sure. What's up, Randall? What were you saying? Um, yeah, I was going to basically say the same thing. I could research that. I'm not, you know, I'm not well versed in astrology per se, um, but I can certainly look at my astronomical software and see what is going on with Uranus and if there's anything, you know, yeah. particular that, that stands out. Um, like, is it closer to us or yeah. Where is it? It is orbit relative to us. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't understand. I, right. And I don't claim to be an astrologer. Even uh, though maybe, maybe it was moving into, sorry, Randall, maybe it was moving into one of the particular signs. That, the, that would undoubtedly be it. Uranus yeah, is the con into, yeah, the contribution of Uranus with whatever sign it's moving into spelled uh, out the geological changes. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll get the details on that. Okay, that's still just another that's, that's another clockwork. way to describe the pattern that we're in right now with right. our position relative to the sun and then the position of of Uranus. So it's, yeah, it's, 
basically the right. same deal. Yeah. Moving into the sign basically is saying like, this is where it is in the clockwork mechanism of the solar system. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right on. That's cool. I'm going to go ahead while we're discussing and pull up a sky map and have a look. All right. All right. Let's have a look at it. What? what didn't this there you go. earthquake start with, you were talking about the recent ones that happened in the you know, communications went down or something. Yeah, that's what he was commenting on. Right. He was addressing that. But in the book, the guy was saying it, this was happening back in the seventies. Yeah. So it's he the said the same, same thing. That there was a big blackout because the ionosphere basically went away over that area because right. of the electrical column. So the idea was, is this recent earthquake that happened in California where they had a, basically a ham radio radio blackout over that whole area and maybe other radio i don't know but it's it, it's possibly because the ionosphere just like sort yeah. of whoosh, like went away because there's this enormous electrical column from the stresses before and after and during the earthquake which is why i brought it up in the first place and and then randall's like well i don't have anything to say about that <laughs> explained the entire thing so <laughs> <laughs> we always wondered if, about that too that that earthquakes having massive piezoelectric effects and uh -huh. that, that, that's just crazy yeah what's the name of that book again space time transients and unusual events man nah, gonna have to get that one get that book folks <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it's still in print. I mean, it was published in 77. It's probably been reprinted. Yeah. If not, uh, you could probably find it, somebody selling it online. Right. Um, find a digital version, maybe. Yeah, right. maybe. Um, so, Randall, do you think that, uh, I mean, I know you're looking at star maps now, but I'm still thinking about this possible, these electrical activities. And uh -huh. Real quick, who's the author? There were two. Uh, Michael... Um, Persinger. Yeah, I mean, we're just scratching the surface of this, so that's okay. It is. Um, Michael A. Persinger, P-E-R-S-I-N-G-E-R. Gieslane, spelled G-Y-S-L-A-I-N-E-F. Lafreniere, L-A-F-R-E-N-I-E-R-E. -E -E. Space, time, transients, and unusual events. Uh, it was published by Nelson Hall in Chicago in 1977. Wow. That's what I can tell you about it. Great. Lafreniere. Lafreniere. I guess that's how you say it. <laughs> close um, enough. Close enough. Yeah. As long as you have the, the spelling of it. Yeah. Um, All right. Cool. Cool. Thanks. What was your... Well, I was just going to say that there's... You could even... Um, you know, there have always been like sort of known hotspots for quote unquote UFO activity mm -hmm. or any kind of whatever you would think of as paranormal stuff. And it could be the same thing that, um, that there are earth forces involved in whatever's happening there. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, 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 it makes sense because you know, you have to wonder like, why are there geological or, or geographical hotspots for this kind of thing? Well, if the, if all the subtle forces that are in that area are like conducive to those paranormal thing happening, th those paranormal things happening, whatever they may be, whether they're being induced into the mind by the subtle forces or they are actually the veil is thin there because of those subtle forces, whatever it may be, it, it makes sense that that there have to be geological forces involved. So. Sure. All right, I am going to share a screen here in a second. Okay, let's see if this will show up. <laughs> Here. Ah. So it would look like Uranus is transiting into the constellation of Aries. Yeah. Okay. Having been uh, moving through Pisces for quite some time. Um, What's the arrow showing us there? The arrow on the purple line? What's is that showing us the direction of the arrow on the purple line? It's like a triangle. There's a little triangle on the purple. Yeah, right there. Oh, okay. That would be the direction of precession. Okay. Yep. Notice the bull and the Pleiades. Yep, saw that. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know? So that sounds familiar. She was she was saying that that yeah, it was going into Aries. So Aries represented this. Uh, I'll, I'll get I'll get a reading on that. Okay. But yeah, maybe it was uh, Popo down in Mexico City that blasted off again, and then uh, there, there there was like two or three within two weeks, I guess maybe three months ago that that lit up, and uh, that was right when right when that was started as transition. Aries is is the uh, is the equivalent sign to Mars, the That's sign, right, of war. sign of turmoil. Yeah. Or, yeah. The orbital period of Aries is about 84 years, so it spends on average about seven years in each of the 12 signs. That's the mm -hmm. signs, but of course the, the constellations are not. You, you can notice here, um, as I'm sharing the screen, you'll notice the, uh, the ecliptic longitude of Pisces compared to Aries. Right. So actually, if you're going to be... Uh, strictly correct and you're going to talk about the age of Aries it would actually be much shorter than the age of Pisces right. so you're that's an, that's an awesome screen share by the way that's that that's cool that you pulled that up oh cool yeah I'm <clears throat> glad you can see it yep. yeah it's moving pretty smoothly too it's good 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 well yeah we can do all kinds of cool things with this so you were saying the orbital period of, of Uranus right that's, yeah yeah okay it's 80 around 84 i don't know the exact off the top of my head but it's about 84 years oh that's a lot shorter than i would have expected well it yep. looks like looks like uh isn't it it's, I think it's eight. halfway through aries is it right uh maybe a third of the way through yeah okay so uh So there haven't been any, any more aftershocks that uh, seven point whatever was was the last one and biggest one. I haven't heard anything in the last several days. I think so, and I think I think they're worried that that that's going to. I don't I don't know any of this, and that I, I can't confirm any of this. But I was seeing some people saying, or some maybe I was seeing it on some new thing saying that uh, one of the last really big San Andreas earthquakes was preceded by this exact same fault sort of kicking off uh, that's what i was going to say that some people think that it's still this could still be a four a four right. shock yes not an aftershock but a four shock of a bigger one right coming yeah. yeah yeah but this fault slips first and then that causes a cascading effect that results in the san andreas and you know california breaks off and falls into the water or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and yellowstone erupts and covers the uh that's west, right. the western hemisphere that's right yeah, when I was in my last year of high school in 1968, I had a poster up on the wall of my bedroom, and it was North American continent, and California was a big fracture, and it, California had come loose from the rest of North America and was falling into the Pacific. <laughs> yeah. And then the, the caption said, goodbye, California. <laughs> <laughs> so... So get your, get your beach... Even back then, people were expecting California was going to fall into the ocean. Right. So get your beachfront property in Utah, whatever. Nevada. <laughs> <In> Nevada. <laughs> uh -huh. Start buying it now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, Uranus is 84 years, just slightly over 84 years. Okay. And then Neptune is, is 165 years. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. There it is, yeah. Yeah. So... Well, so, yeah, because Uranus is number seven out from the sun. Neptune is number eight. Right. And planet X is now number nine, right? <laughs> if there is a planet X. And Pluto's mad. Yeah. And Pluto's really upset, yeah. It can't be X anymore. It has to be IX because it's actually planet nine now. There, there we go. <laughs> so astronomy yeah. is one of the multiple sciences included within cosmography. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah, there's a lot more we could get into here on this subject of um, forces and how ancient peoples may or may not have been able to exploit these forces for <clears throat> technological purposes. Um, and that's something we could explore deeper in future podcasts for sure. Right. Oh, that's ripe. 
Ripe. <laughs> just a tease there. I was just thinking actually that um, I think that uh, is it. It's it's Teotihuacan in Mexico City and Gunung Padang are both over the uh, lava tubes that are deep down underground. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, in, remember the word intrusions? Right. Yes. I was talking about? Yeah. The subterranean world is intruding up into the, into the world, the sub aerial world. Right. Yeah. So why would they build over those unless they were accessing those forces in some way or another? Is yeah, that, yeah. The idea. To to what extent have you guys looked into the work of Wilhelm Reich? Uh, I have looked into it, um, not not incredibly deeply, but I know the story. I know the idea. Okay. Tell the story. <laughs> the I don't know. He's the Orgone. Uh, I think the Orgone energy guy. Yeah, he's the Orgone energy guy. Yes. Yeah. I have, I have gone down that rabbit hole a little bit. So. You've gone down that, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's definitely a rabbit hole. Um, let's have a look here. Um, That's yeah, the question. I'm not sure what that Can is. Can we build an organ generator? Rant, rant. You, you got several podcasts where the material there with Wilhelm Reich. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. But why, why are you connecting that to what we were just talking about? Like, that's what I want to know right now. Is this the vortex? Stuff? No, this is the. Oh, that's what you want to know. Okay. Uh, what what brought that to your mind is what I'm trying to figure have out. You, have you got the screen? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Share screen. Okay. Uh, what happened to it? Uh, let's try it again. Can you see the screen? We see it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and look at all that interesting stuff over there. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Scrolls past it. <laughs> oh man. Go. Yeah. There he is being taken to prison for daring to use life force to heal people. Right. Yeah. Well, didn't he quote unquote, he irradiated his entire property. That's why they were taking him to prison. Right. They shut him down. That was what they said. No, well, it was actually the FDA. Oh, um, okay. FDA was trying to shut down his cancer, his cancer quackery, uh. as they called it. But the thing is, and, and there are still those who, who, who maintain, you know, oh, Wilhelm Reich was a total quack, right? Right. But interestingly, when the FDA was trying to solicit plaintiffs in a fraud case against uh, Reich, they went to dozens and dozens of his patients being treated by his methodology, and they couldn't find a single one to, to sign on as a complainant because they all claimed they were being helped by the, by the, uh, the therapy that he was uh, doing. And so what they then had to do was they got him on contempt of court charge because they sent a letter, uh, one of the courts, circuit courts, I believe, there in, in Maine, uh, sent a letter to him claiming he had to cease and desist his treatments. And what he did was he wrote back to the court saying he wanted his methods to be judged by uh, a group of his scientific peers and not a, a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> and it was on the basis of that letter that they charged him with uh, contempt of court. Yeah. And this is after his arrest. This picture is his arrest for contempt of court. And agents uh, came out of the FDA and uh, to his laboratory in Rangeley, Maine. And they went into his laboratory and confiscated two truckloads of papers and took them and notes and books and, and research that he had done. Two truckloads, took those to an incinerator and had them burned oh, and God. went into his laboratory with sledgehammers and smashed all of his equipment. So that was what was going on in hey. 1950. Seven. That's definitely so, what you do when you know that you're right about your your case. Yeah, <laughs> you burn all of the <laughs> opposing right. documents and smash all of these stuff. Right. Yeah. Because here you, we go. Here's the quote from Judge John D. Clifford from a 1954 U.S. court ruling, in which all of Dr. Reich's books and research journals were banned and ordered burned in incinerators. Reich was sent to a federal penitentiary where he died. And this was the ruling of Judge John D. Clifford. The orgone energy does not exist. 
or you might say the life energy does not exist. And so basically what you're doing is denying the traditions of, you know, dozens of cultures all over the world going back to the earliest recorded history that had some concept of a life energy or a bio energy or some idea of a subtle force. So what you what you're doing here is you're throwing out that entire legacy by saying this, by saying that that the orgon, you're saying basically there is no such thing as life energy. And all of these cultures that that have recognized life energy in one form or another were obviously all, you know, misguided and and uneducated and pre-scientific illiterates. Um, Yet what he was doing, um, I guess at the time, probably had to be shut down. You know, his his son, Peter Reich, wrote a book. I think it was, came out in the 70s called A Book of Dreams. And he talks about his last visit to, to, to Wilhelm in his cell on the eve of his being released. And Wilhelm told his son, Peter, that they would not let him out of his cell. They, they would not free him alive. And the day he was to be released, he was by coincidence found dead in his cell. Um, the autopsy report said it was heart failure. His heart failed. But, you know, um, pretty much. But of course, in most cases that. where a person is murdered, their heart does fail. That's right. <laughs> yeah. What, what were they railroading him for? Like, what, what do you think they were really, who was it? Who was behind the uh, destruction? Good question. I don't know. You know, other than the, the overt one, which was the, the, the Food and Drug Administration, um, who basically instigated all these proceedings against him, I don't know. They were just By the time it got to his release from prison after two years, you know, who might have engineered that? If, if it was, in fact, something other than a coincidence. It, listen, it may have been a coincidence because I have no evidence other than the fact that it is a bizarre coincidence. Right. That he not only told his son this, his son recorded it in the book years later, but he did in fact die in his in his prison cell. Right. So um Well, as as my favorite commentator, Malcolm Nance, recent has, has repeatedly said, Coincidence takes planning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. So can we build a generator or going generator render is there not enough information remaining for us to do that. Cause this is the first thing that Kyle and I always think of is like, okay, we're looking at these, these, um, these devices that people have supposedly come up and, and the f first question is, is can we make one? Well, take a look right here. Can you see my screen? I see it. Okay. Now that's a simple one. That's an accumulator. And the key is in the layering in an orgone accumulator. Uh, steel wool, huh? Uh-huh. Interesting. And fiberglass. See, that's it it's looks alter like alternating material. See, steel wool and fiberglass. Right. So you've got a metal and you've got a silicate. Uh, in some cases, they would use uh, an organic material and an inorganic material. Again, to create this dielectric, to create this right. um, this difference. Potential differences, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Like a capacitor type of thing? Yeah. What's that? It looks like a capacitor. Like a capacitor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which which has been found in some of the earthen mounds. Well, Brad, you're 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 jumping the gun there, Brad. But but oh. yeah, I don't want I don't want to I don't <laughs> I don't know when we're going to cut it off here, so I'm I'm learning well, about cl what, cliffhangers for another couple of minutes, <laughs> and then we'll call it call it for tonight. I um, was going to say it looked like something that you could wrap the shamir in to yeah, keep it safe. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so let's let's see let's learn a little bit about here these orgone accumulators. In 1940, Reich invented a way to concentrate the orgone energy. He constructed an orgone accumulator, a box whose walls, floor and ceiling consisted of several layers of alternating organic and metallic material. Observations and experiments have shown that organic material attracts and collects orgone from the atmosphere and that metallic material attracts and repels orgone. Thus, the organic layers of the accumulator attract and soak up orgone and the metallic layers draw it from the organic material and radiate it into the interior of the accumulator. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that was from Ola Rackness. Uh, who published a book in 1970 called Wilhelm Reich and Organomy. He went on to say a universal 
ubiquitous energy may be supposed to behave and to act according to its own inherent laws. In some cases, and further future knowledge may multiply them, the orgon energy can be directed and used for special purposes. The first application of orgon energy came with the construction of the orgon accumulator in its various forms. The accumulators are constructed to concentrate and irradiate orgon with the object of stimulating the natural functioning. A third application of the orgone energy is the cloud buster. I have already described how this can influence weather. If this apparatus could be more studied and used, in my opinion, it might be the greatest importance of all orgone devices, uh, and which I would have to concur with that. Um, in another work, Orgon, Reich, and Eros, Edward Mann in 1973 said, in brief, the boxes which began as observation chambers were found to draw in Orgon and eventually were labeled Orgon accumulators. Experiments proved, and here's crucial, the greater the layering of the walls, the greater, up to a point, the concentration or amount of Orgon. In time, accumulators of up to 20 layers were built. Now what is significant about that is quite simply uh, this. Here's a work, The Sphinx and the Megaliths from John Ivamy, 1975. Um, and he's talking about Silbury Hill right here, famous uh, earthen mound in England, not far from where Graham Hancock lives, right? So he's describing the structure of Silbury Hill. He says, under excavating under the directions of Professor R.J.C. Atkinson in the last few years have revealed many details previously unknown about the methods used in the construction of Silbury Hill. That pyramid was not built in the way one might expect Stone Age aboriginals to have built it by simply digging a ditch and shoveling the material from it into a heap in the middle as children build sandcastles on the beach. Far from it. Silbury Hill was a complex piece of engineering involving advanced methods of construction similar to those used in the Egyptian pyramids. For the main part of the hill, the material dug from the ditch was laid systematically in horizontal layers, the outer edges of which were reveted by means of sloping retaining walls made by large blocks of chalk. Uh, and then we can jump across the ocean to the On the Mounds and Relics of the Ancient Nations of America, written in 1846, extracted from a letter by Dr. G. A. Mantell in the American Journal of Science, uh, published in 1846. I went and found the original work in which this was published, and I'll skip one page here because he's talking about mounds uh, and relics, um, the mounds of Ohio and Scioto Valley, and this is what they found when they were excavating that the merely sepulchral piles of our earth mounds thrown up at random without arrangement of the materials, but those covering altars were artificially stratified, layer over layer of alternating beds of gravel, earth, and sand, but following a common curvature like a series of caps drawn over the same head. We know not why the altars were covered with so much care or why covered at all, Probably the proceeding was interwoven with their religious notions. <laughs> uh, E.J. Squire, 1847, observations on the uses of the mounds of the West with an attempt at their classification. And this is what he points out as one of the most important aspects of these mounds is the fact of stratification in the mounds. It's one of great interest and importance. The feature has heretofore been remarked but not described with proper accuracy and has consequently proved an impediment to the recognition of the artificial origin of the mounds by those who have never seen them. The stratification, so far as observed, is not horizontal but always conforms to the convex outline of the mound. Wow. So I think here is a little bit of uh, food for uh, thought. Um, possibly we can see some correlations here. Yeah. Um, if we're open to this kind of a thing, the point being is that on both sides of the ocean with only a cursory examination, we see that these earthwork structures bear a similar internal architecture. And this has to do with the layering and the stratification of alternative, alternative types of materials. And we found that was the basic principle behind the construction of an orgone accumulator. Correct? Correct. All right. So was there we are. Gobekli Tepe was also buried that same way. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Was, was there stratification at Gobekli Tepe? Yes, it was stratified. And so it maybe was, it was supposed to 
like we're taking them apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. So again, is this coincidence possibly that they were building these structures all over the planet and using the same kind of principles of astronomy, of geology, of, of engineering, of, you see, you can say that those of us who are looking at these kind of things and hypothesizing that there was some unknown science or some unknown civilization that could have had uh, access to this kind of science, we're the ones who are being labeled as the fringe and the pseudoscientists and so on. And yet I look at it and I go, you've got a whole big group out there that basically is scared of looking at these alternative paradigms for whatever reason, psychological, emotional, whatever, or invested, uh, economic, whatever. They don't want to look at what's staring us in the face. And, and you cannot just cavalierly wave your arm and make this stuff go away because it ain't going away. We're just learning more and more how truly mysterious and deep the human past on planet Earth really is. And, and, and it ain't going away. In spite of the efforts of the, the debunkers and so on, it ain't going away. That's right. And like Mike said, coincidence takes planning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It is a coincidence that it took place. So we can <laughs> we're we're definitely be coming back to these themes uh, yeah. because there's obviously a whole lot more to this than we've talked about in a few minutes here tonight. That's right. Yeah. Now we have all the time in the world. That's we're going right. to keep publishing these podcasts, so we will, we will be able to dive deep into every one of these subjects. Right, Randall? Uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever you say, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> all right, do we have you an email? Me, buddy. <laughs> do we have an email we can give out yet? Yeah, Brad, we got it. We got an email for the uh, podcast yet? Uh, I think we're going to get uh, Darren's assistance with that, but no. Okay. okay. It'll right, happen, so, folks. And right, so next, we, next time, any moment, yeah. Right. So right now we're still Thank doing it. Uh, we, we, we will have the website and the feed up soon, uh, but right now we can't give them to you because we don't know what they are. So. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> All right. Getting there. That's a wrap. Appreciate you guys. Episode two. Thank you guys very much. See you next time. Well done. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. 